Do you want to go from this to this? Well then, follow along. In computer graphics, using textures and materials correctly is possibly one of the most important things to get a realistic scene. This is especially important in HDRP to make full use of the pipeline. By now, you have most likely heard that you can use more than just the albedo map to create a more detailed material. But first and foremost, it's important to understand what each of these maps do and how to use them correctly in HDRP. So let's do a very quick rundown of different texture maps. Normal map. You've probably heard of this one before. Bam! Instant detail. A normal map adds surface detail without increasing the geometry. It simulates bumps and grooves by altering the way light interacts with the surface. In HDRP, make sure your normal map texture is properly imported by setting the texture type to normal map in the import settings. Height map. You can think of this like a normal map, but this actually displaces the surface geometry. This will create real depth and not just the illusion. Obviously because of this, they'll use more performance than normal maps. These type of maps are especially useful if you want to make a material for cobblestones. To use a height map, select Lit Tessellation Shader, then for Displacement Mode, select Tessellation Displacement. Then select Fong for Tessellation Mode, and you should be able to use a height map. Metallic Map As the name suggests, this map determines which part of your material are metallic and which are non-metallic. Ambient Occlusion Map AO maps are great for enhancing shadows. They bring out the depth by adding subtle contact shadows in crevices. Smoothness Map This map shows how sharp or blurry reflections are. Detail maps. These extra maps allow you to add secondary textures that only appear when the camera is close to the object. Usually used to add fine details like scratches, grain, or pores Bruh. without affecting much performance. Alright, okay, now that we have a basic understanding of what each map does, let's try and actually use them in our HDRP project. But before we get to it, where can we get high quality textures with those detail maps? Well, I've got some good news for you. Do you know about Quixel Megascans? Quixel Megascans offer these high quality assets completely free, which is absolutely insane. While they were previously exclusive to Unreal Engine, the recent move to the Fab marketplace now allows you to use them in Unity projects as well. Speaking of Fab, it's worth exploring their marketplace in general. They offer a wide range of Unity compatible assets, including limited time free offerings of industry grade quality. This video isn't sponsored, but I would love to be sponsored. Uh, now that we have the textures we need, let's try using them when importing your textures, make sure to set the texture type to default, except for your normal map, and disable sRGB. So now, let me just assign the albedo, normal, and ambient occlusion map. Um, at this point, you'll notice that some of your maps can't be assigned directly to the default HDRP lit shader. So, what's going on here? Well, the answer is simple. You assign them all under the mask map. HDRP uses something called channel-packed textures, which means that it stores multiple material maps within a single texture. And this does it by combining four grayscale maps into a single texture, but in four separate color channels. And guess what? Maps like ambient occlusion, metallic, roughness, and similar are all grayscale textures. This method is much more efficient because it allows the renderer to sample four maps with just a single texture fetch. If you look at the Unity documentation, it explains exactly how to channel pack these textures. Now, you could use image editing software like Photoshop to create channel packed textures, but there's also a handy open source Unity plugin that can do this. Once you've installed the plugin, go to Window, then Channel Packer. Add an input then select the texture and the appropriate channel. For ambient occlusion, I'd select the green channel. Once all your textures are added, simply save and apply the texture to your material. Um, if you have a roughness map instead of a smoothness map, then don't worry. A roughness map is just the inverse of a smoothness map. You can use Unity's import settings to convert it. Under import settings, go to advanced, select swizzle, and choose 1 minus R, G, and B. The simple solution is to use the Adaptive Probe Volumes feature in Unity 6, period. Go to HDRP Quality Settings, under Lighting, select Adaptive Probe Volumes for your Light Probe system instead of Light Probe Groups, hit Bake Lighting in the Lighting tab, and you're done. <clears throat> so, you're looking for an explanation? 
All right, let's get into it. But first, there are a few things we should go over. Direct light is light that comes straight from a light source towards an object. Think of it like shining a flashlight directly at something. Indirect light is light that bounces off other surfaces before reaching an object. When you shine a flashlight at a white wall, the wall then illuminates the entire room. Indirect light is exactly what makes scenes look natural and provides realistic lighting. Now, the objects in your Unity scene that you know Will not move during gameplay should be set as static. That way when you bake lighting for your scene, it will calculate light bounces for the static objects and save them as light maps, which are basically textures that will be applied on top of the objects. However, because they're just simple textures, when lighting conditions change or if there's a moving object, things start to look odd and out of place. That is why we have something called real-time global illumination sort of. The idea is that we want dynamic objects to receive and react to indirect lighting from the environment in real time and also adapt to light condition changes. Unfortunately, in Unity, this is not actually real real-time global illumination. Instead, it's actually called pre-baked real-time global illumination. What this means is that Unity pre-calculates how light might bounce around your scene and stores this information in a way that can be quickly applied to moving objects. The use case for Unity's real-time global illumination is typically a game with a time-of-day system or any scenario where lighting conditions change dynamically. Oh, and also keep in mind that real-time global illumination takes up quite a lot of performance. Alright, now let's talk about light probes and their history a little bit. They are basically points in 3D space that store information about indirect lighting at their specific locations. These must be baked before runtime. When a dynamic object moves through your scene, Unity samples these probes to figure out how that object should be lit. The downside of traditional light probes is that an artist must place them manually around the scene. And that's where probe volumes come in. There are 3D volumes in your scene that let Unity automatically place light probes for you. These probe volumes distribute light probes in a very consistent manner. In other words, they will place probes at regular intervals throughout the volume, even in areas where lighting barely changes. This, of course, wasn't very efficient. You'd end up with way more probes than you actually need in some areas, and maybe not enough in others, lacking detail. And so now, finally with Unity 6, we have something called Adaptive Probe Volumes. They are basically the smart version of probe volumes. Instead of placing probes at regular intervals, Unity analyzes your scene and places more probes in areas where lighting changes dramatically and fewer probes in areas where lighting is more uniform. This means you get better lighting quality where you need it and better performance where you don't. Now, here's a quick example of where this makes a huge difference. You can clearly observe how lighting transitions smoothly as objects move through the scene. Editor Coder here. Thanks for making this far into the video. Adaptive probe volumes only affect objects that move in real time. Now, if you look back at the before and after comparison I did earlier, you might notice there are additional improvements beyond than just adaptive pro volumes. And you're right, I also baked the lighting in the scene. Um, but this is also something I've said. It's baked so, lighting in the lighting tab. So I guess the real tip is to bake your lighting. This has been Semicoder. I kind of know how to code. Quicksil Mega Scans are free only before the end of this year, so grab them now while you still can. This is actually also one of the reasons why I decided to make this video, so go get it.